nice to have this cool weather out here. Who's turned their air conditioner off already? Got her off, huh? All right. Uh, supposed to cool down again this weekend, and then I think, uh, I thought I saw Tuesday. The high Tuesday was supposed to be like 65. Yeah. That's good working weather, isn't it? Yeah, hunting weather. Right? Eight, eight more weeks, something like that? Amen. All oh, praise the Lord for you being here tonight. I'm glad you're here. Glad I don't have to stand here all by myself and just preach to my wife. She might start preaching back. Why are you laughing at that, Jimmy? Um, you better pray for your country. I, um, this is probably the most vocal that I've ever been toward any elected official. But I believe with all my heart that the current president of the United States is a, is a disgrace to the people of America. That's not going to win me any points when I've come up for re-election. The man's got, hang on a second, the man's got a serious issue that he's got to deal with in the Middle East. He snubs the president, or the uh, prime minister of Israel, prime minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, said, I want to come to Washington and meet with you. And Obama said, you know, I'm going to be out of town in Las Vegas. I'm going to be doing uh, uh, the uh, David Letterman show, and so I won't be able to make it. That's what he said. Okay, 9-11, September 11th, and the president gets up and makes a speech. Never one time does he use the word God or prayer or anything. Not one time. Not once. Okay? And then, um, the very people that Barack Obama sent money to in Libya to take over that country stormed our embassy last night killed our ambassador and drug his body paraded his dead body through the streets of Libya and these that's the Muslim Brotherhood that our president sent money to to help take over Egypt and Libya it's a disgrace and an embarrassment to America. We need prayer. Amen. We are in. Go ahead. My name is Bud Nelson. This is called Lake Fun, the Moss, or whatever it is. But what about the other groups there is in America? You got the cap, you got the pants, you got the groups. Mm hmm. But we can make fun of them. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's no good. And um, I hope America will wake up. Now, I'm not, I'm not happy about this election year. And again, I think they're trying to force somebody down my throat that I'm not for. But I will go on the record as saying this man is, he should not be allowed to continue to be president after this election. I'm not condoning death. I'm not condoning anything like that. That's unbiblical and it's wrong. But I'm saying, I'm saying to us here in this church, we need prayer. Our country, we are in bad shape. And it's going to get worse when you, when you turn your back on the people of Israel. Regardless, I, I don't care. When you turn your back, when you curse the people that God said they're blessed, you're in trouble. And you don't do that. And by the way, the Mormon idea of Israel is that Mormons believe they are Israel. That's, that's cursing Israel as well. It's the same concept. And so you just, you just don't do that. And um, what a time we live in. Well, I'm glad I'm grounded in the truth. I'm glad my soul is anchored. Amen. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight and ask God blessing. And we're going to study the, the tabernacle a little bit. I love to talk about this. And just a beautiful, God showed me something really neat today. And it was just a blessing to me. And I want to share it with you. And I want to be a blessing to you tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we do thank you, dear God, for our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord, he came as a Jew. He came, as Lord, to his own people. Why? Because he loved them. He loved his own people. He wailed over Jerusalem and cried over Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Lord, I believe just like in, with Joseph, Lord, who ran and fell upon the necks of his brethren and hugged them and kissed them and loved them. I, Lord, I believe that's your heart for Israel. And, uh, Lord, I know there's a lot of things wrong in the world, and I know there's a lot of things wrong with the Jews right now. Their doctrine, their religion's messed up. Lord God, they're just, there's all kinds of wicked things going on there. But you made a promise, Lord, to them, and you intend to keep that promise. And, Lord, I'm, I'm just counting on, Lord, you being faithful to Israel, Lord, because I'll know you're faithful to me. And I just pray, dear God, that you would turn this country around. Lord, it's in, in either direction that we head into, Lord, in the election, it's the wrong way. We ask you, God, Lord, that you would just raise up preachers and pastors, Lord, like you did in the Old Testament, in the old times, you raise up the prophets, the judges, the men of God who would preach without apology, preach without worrying about a paycheck. Preach, dear God, Lord, that even if they were under threat of getting their head cut off or being cast in prison, that, Father, they would just preach and preach and preach. And, Lord, that America would repent and turn from her wicked ways. And, Lord, that you would have favor again upon this country and upon this land. Lord, that's what we're asking you tonight. Lord, it doesn't matter to us how you do it. We would just like to see it done. Lord, Father, we, Lord, I pray. I'm sincere, Lord, in praying for the safety of the President of the United States and his family. Lord God, what a mess that would create. Lord, I pray for his soul. He's lost. He claims to be a Christian, but Lord, he's, he denies you in deed and in word. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you, would, that you would break him and make him in your image and save the man. Save his daughter, save his wife, dear God. And Lord, Father, that when they get saved and get the Spirit in them, we know, God, Lord, that your word just enters into them and they just think the right way. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would help them do that. Father, we're here tonight. We just thank you, dear God, for what you've done in our lives. And Lord, Father, we love our country. We love our church. We love one another. And Lord, Father, maybe it's been a tough week on some people. And I pray, God, Lord, that you'd let it be a blessing for each and one of us tonight. Help us, Lord, to, to glean great and mighty things from your word tonight, Lord, things that we may never have thought of before, but things, Lord, that are ever true with us. And, Father, I want to thank you, dear God, in advance, Lord, for what you've shown me out of the Bible tonight. And I thank you, Lord, for God, for the promise that it means to me. And, Lord, Father, give us hope and give us promises tonight. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. I was uh, looking over this, and, and uh, I always, every Wednesday, I always forget where I left off the previous Wednesday. And I don't know if I've even touched on this or not. I don't know if I'm supposed to be in chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, or whatever. But I, my, my, my eyes caught on this in Hebrews chapter 9, verse, about the first, um, first five verses that we're going to deal with tonight. And I'm just going to show you some, some really, really good things from the Word uh, tonight, who in here tonight is a is a sinner? Raise your hand. Yeah. Amen. Okay, you're unclean and you're undone, and everybody here is aware of their flesh and aware of the things that that this flesh is capable of, and the thoughts that we have. Sometimes the the deeds and the words that we say uh, are not right, and it's always absolutely amazed me. It just it just blows me away. That the God of the entire universe, in fact, he's so big, our God is so big, that the, Bible's, the Bible says that the heavens basically fit in the span of his hand. He's, he's that big. He's got the entire universe, like, right here. And when he, when he told Solomon, he said, yeah, I'll, I'll bless your little temple there, but I want you to ask yourself the question, show me the place in this universe that can contain me. Show me where it is that I can reside. Show me where that is. And the truth of it is, no earthly building, no warehouse, no stadium 
Not even the entire earth can contain our God. Somebody say amen. He's larger than everything. He is the creator of everything. He is wise and knowledgeable and powerful beyond even our comprehension. For everything that we have, that we can feel and we can taste and touch and see and smell and hear, all the things that our five senses react to and react against, God made them completely out of nothing. Out of zero. Mankind loves to take the things that God made and tries to remake stuff or invent stuff. God did it all out of absolutely nothing. He just said, light! And there was light. That's how powerful God is. That's how wise and how big He is. And that's how mighty and majesty He is. Even Lucifer himself will bow his knee to Jesus Christ. And that God lives inside of me. I don't comprehend that. That is, that is far beyond my, my ideas. I don't, I don't comprehend that. Because when I compare myself, I mean, it's one thing to hear these educated elite, these biologists and these physicists and these geologists and these scientists who mock at, at religion and mock God and say, you poor pitiful people. If you just had the education that I had, then you would know that there is no God. I am God. And that's one thing. I just go, Pfft. They profess themselves to be wise, but they're fools. But I, I just sit and, and my mind cannot comprehend how the God of this universe, the creator of all things, would ever choose to live inside of me and put his glory there that's that's an amazing thing so I want us to look at this in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 1 and Paul says then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary I want you to think about the sanctuary now I want you to think about uh, let me just kinda describe it for for just a minute I, I had actually worked up some slides to show you and I forgot to put the projector and screen up yeah so I still got them if you want to see them after the thing but I want you to imagine um, this this big rectangular tent or this big rectangular wall made out of canvas or hides or whatever it was and these poles sticking up out of the ground and they were spaced apart such, such and such and then you walk inside of that, and when you walk inside of that, there is, this is, this is basically the, the sanctuary. It's the, the, whole, the whole construct is the tabernacle. You walk inside of that, and there's an, there's an altar, and there's a priest there, and he's pro it, either in the process of slaying an animal, or he's already slain it, and he's washing the entrails with water like they were supposed to do, or he has already laid it upon uh, the, 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 um, the altar and it's burning and that, that smell, that odor, it, it would smell like barbecue is what it would smell like. It would smell like you were grilling meat. And that smell is going up before God and God is accepting that temporarily as, as a partial token payment for the sins of Israel. The full payment was to be paid by Christ. But here you, you walk in there and there, there's the altar and uh, then there is a, a big giant brass bowl there that's called the laver. They're to wash their hands and wash before they go in there. And then you go into a, a, a building, as it were, and the front of the building, it's, it's, got, uh, it's got like a, a, a covering, uh, like a veil there that's supported by four posts. And then you have boards that are running down the... the both sides of it, it's a long rectangle, boards running down the side of it and across the back. So the back wall and the side walls are all made out of wood, but the entrance is just like a, like a tent covering. You have to, you know, it's like a veil. It closes and you go in and open up. Then when you walk in, you have, and we'll, we'll read the description here, but you walk in and you have a table here with bread and you have a candle over here. Then there's another veil, and, and you, I say when you go back there, nobody was ever allowed to go back there except the high priest. But that was where the Ark of the Covenant was. 
And all of that is a picture. And I had a friend of mine that we got acquainted with. Lisa and I met him at a conference, Dr. Chuck Thurston. And this thing about DNA that, that I, the video I put out, the idea started with him. He is an emergency room medical doctor. And these guys are, medical room ER docs are sharp. And they have to be fast, they have to think fast. And so he's no dummy. But he, he's the one that, that showed me that, my, he said, Mike, the wilderness tabernacle. He said, I studied cellular biology in college, training to be a doctor. I know what a cell looks like. And he said, every cell in your body is, is made exactly in the image of that tabernacle. And I went, and he said, the Bible, God was not kidding, in 1 Corinthians, where Paul said, what, know you not, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's not just some spiritual pie-in-the-sky talk. He, God designed every piece of your body under a microscope, looks exactly what I just described to you. The fact that there's an altar there at the end of the, the cell wall is the curtain around the tabernacle. And once food gets inside the cell wall, you know what your cell does with it? Burns it, converts it to energy. Just like in the tabernacle. Everything that went in that tabernacle ended up on that altar burnt. Okay? And he said, Mike, get this. Moses wrote a book and put it in the, in the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. And he said, that's your DNA inside of the nucleus of the cell. And I just went... And God began to show me that, and I, be, I, I went way farther with it than he did. Okay? And he, we've had, we, he's kind of helped me along the way and helped me well with ideas and things like that. But when the Bible says that you are the tabernacle of God, it means exactly what it says, and that everything in your body is designed to follow that. And I know I've taught on this before, but I'm going to show you something... That, that will help you tonight with this idea, does God really dwell with me? And ask yourself the question, does God really dwell with me? And I'm going to show you this from this description in Hebrews chapter 9 of the tabernacle. So he said in verse 2, Hebrews chapter 9, for there was a tabernacle made. There was a tabernacle made. The first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. I want you to underline that. And I want you to think about that. And he said, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold. I want you to think about that. Uh, what was the Ark of the Covenant made of? Does anybody know what the Ark of the Covenant was made of? That was the Ark of Noah. That's what Bradley said. Okay. Same ark, different story, okay, different wood. It wasn't gopher wood. I'll tell you what it was in a minute. And if you'll, you ought to shout. If you, if you just get happy enough tonight, it's okay for you to shout out. Okay? And so anyway, which was, and, and so anyway, the ark was overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables... Of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Heavenly Father, help me to preach this tonight. Lord Father, our country needs help. Please bless us. And Lord Father, just give us a good study in your word tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. First, I want to I want to show you this this tabernacle just for a minute as the way the Bible sort of lays it out. I had mentioned that that the, the wall structure of the tabernacle going down the north side and the south side. Those were the two long sides of the tabernacle and across the back was made out of boards and these boards. There was 20 down the north side and there was 20 down the south side. How many we got so far, Jim? Forty. He says, 40? Are you sure? 40. Yeah. Say it like you're sure. Say, 40. Lori's not, here to help. Lori's not here to help him out. Amen. Okay. Boy, that's a good wife for you. Amen. Honey, it's 40. Okay. And then across the back, there's six. How many we got now? Taylor, help him out. 46. That number is the number of chromosomes in your body where in your cells. In every cell in your body, you have 46 of these chromosomes. When, when, when you were made, your daddy donated 23 voluntarily. 
Your mother donated 23. And the 23 and the 23 came together and they formed you. Let me show you what this looks like in the Bible. Take your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 1. And listen, trust me, it's okay if you want to shout in God's house tonight. I didn't come here tonight to chastise you. I didn't come here to rip you apart. I didn't come here to tell you how sorry and low down you are, well, even though you are sorry and low down. I came here tonight to be a blessing to you. Let me show you what this looks like according to the King James Bible. Genesis chapter 2, at verse 23. And Adam said, now you can do this on your own, but you can trust me for now. I counted every word that Adam said. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. That's 46 words right there. 46 words. And what happens? The man and the woman coming together. I got 23 chromosomes, baby. How many you got, honey? I got 23 too. And they bring those together and out comes one flesh. One flesh. That is a child, a human child. That is the, the, the blessing of marriage, biblical marriage. Husband and wife stuff. Male, female. Amen. Amen. Okay? So that's, that's how we're made. And so here we have the tabernacle now. And it's got these 46 boards that are basically consist of the place where God lives in the midst of the 46 boards. Are you getting what I'm throwing at you tonight? Say amen. Now, does anybody know what, what these boards were made of? Who said it? See, we don't want to say it because we're so vulgar in our country now. Okay? Okay, it's a, I'll say it's a long eye, even though it's not. It's shit and wood. Okay? That's what that is. Does anybody here know what that is? Michael? Do you know what that is? I bet you do. Acacia. You know what that is, don't you? I've been to Kenya. And they got acacia trees. You, you get it? I think so. Okay, hang on. Now, if you feel like shouting, don't let Brian hold you down. Okay? She, see, she's got the bun already. I'll let her be Pentecostal for just a little bit tonight. Amen. Listen to me. Hey, listen to me. We, don't, we, we call them different things. We got kind of trees that are like this over here. We don't call them that. But over in Africa, in the Middle East, they've got these acacia trees all over the place. You know what they are? What are they, Andrea? Was it in the spice that's used later on? No. Uh, don't shout. <laughs> Thorn trees. Thorns. God made the tabernacle. Out of thorns. That's what he did. Thorn, acacia wood, shittim wood, is the wood and the trees grow these, these thorns. That's where they got the crown that they put on Jesus' head. Let me show you where I'm going with this. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 the Bible says, and unto Adam, he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Thorns were the curse of sin. Thorns always are a curse in the Bible. They always represent something that's cursed. So when God, when, when they took a, uh, when they made a crown, literally plaited, which means they, they wove them together. It looks like DNA when you look at it. I'm not kidding you. It looks like the intertwinings of DNA. 
That's what they made that crown out of when they put it on Christ's head. And it was thorns. It was acacia wood. It was, a sh- it was shittim wood. And it represented the curse that reigns over us in our flesh. Are you getting what I'm saying so far? Look in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Let me show you how we got those. I'll show you. Verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said, this is why I don't like snakes, by the way. Because they never tell you when they're sitting there. Amen. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said. I just, believe it or not, I just counted the words that he said here. He said, Yea, if God said, You should not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. Verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, You count his previous words, and add them to this word, Ye shall not surely die. That was a lie, by the way. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You're going to have to trust me on this when you can go home and count it later. Forty-six words here that came out of the serpent's mouth that he spoke to Eve, and she believed it, and Adam did it, and they're cursed. And by the way, their offspring is cursed. Abel was cursed. Seth was cursed. Cain was cursed. Noah had the curse of sin on him. He had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And when they came off the ark into the new world and they they began to repopulate the earth, they repopulated the earth with cursed children. Because they had the curse of sin in them because of their disobedience. It was handed to them genetically. It was in their DNA. It was in their body. Now I want you to get the magnificence of this tonight. Because here we have an earthly tabernacle that was built with the hands of men representing what was built by by God himself up in heaven. But here we have an earthly tabernacle that has these curses all over this shittim wood, this thorn tree wood. And God decides out of his love for his people that he is going to present himself in that place. Somebody say amen. Amen. God decided that. That's why God told Moses, build it out of this wood. Build it exactly. And he specifically said, 20 boards, Moses down this side, 20 boards down that side, six across the back. And I don't think for a second that Moses went, wait a minute. That's the number of chromosomes in our cells. He didn't do that. Those things were hidden back then. They just, hey, With all that we know right now about this Bible and about how right it is, you have no excuse for not believing what's in this book and doing what God said. Moses couldn't even see half of God's glory and he couldn't proclaim it because he was the stammer of his speech and yet Moses did everything God told him to do. You have no excuse, by the way. Somebody say amen to that. So this just blesses my heart. So here is is the picture of, of a human being. Here's the picture now of a cursed sinner. And here is the God of the universe coming down in his glory. By the way, it's not the Shekinah. I'll tell you about that some other time. If you hear a preacher say, oh, it's the Shekinah glory, just go... No. Has anybody here ever read the word Shekinah in your Bible? It's not there, so don't believe it. It's a setup. Okay? Anyway, moving right along. Here is, here is a picture of Jared Lewis. Okay? Can you go along with it? You'll have, yeah, this is the picture of Jared. This is Jared Lewis. This is who he is. He's, he's passed his DNA down. To poor Madeline. You are your father's daughter. You know that, don't you? He's sleeping. Hi, Isaac. How you doing? Okay. But you know what? You just got it from your mom and dad. Who got it from their mom and dad. Who got it from their mom and dad. But here is the God of the whole universe who decides to live inside of you. 
And I want to I want to show you I want to show you something, Jared, that he put inside of you. Okay, you're gonna like what God put inside of you. Okay, you're gonna like this. So now we have the tabernacle. Paul said you go in the tabernacle, and when you walk in there, you have the candlestick. What is the candlestick? Let's go to Book of Revelation, chapter four. Let's let's just not make this up. Let's just follow the Bible. Revelation chapter 4, you hurry up and catch up to me. Revelation 4 verse 5, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. That is um, your heart beating. Electricity signals your heart to beat. That's lightning. And it sounds like thunder and you have voices here. That's you. Throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And so you walk into the tabernacle, and over here on the south is seven candlesticks. The candlesticks, seven of them. The Jews call it the menorah. I don't know what that word means, but the Bible says it's the candlestick, and there were seven lamps in that candlestick. And the only light, listen to me, there was not a TV on the opposite side of the room, and they're providing light. And I'm not, I'm not pitching against TV watching or anything like that, but I'm telling you, you better be careful about where your ideas, your philosophies, your training, your learning, your lessons and everything, your speech and everything. Be careful that the light of your soul is not coming from the television screen. It's coming from the seven spirits of God. Can I get an amen out of somebody? You make sure that that's what's going on. But you walk in the tabernacle and the only light in there is the seven, the menorah, the candlestick. And these are the seven spirits of God. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1 gives us, or verse 2 gives us the enumeration. What are these seven spirits? Isaiah 11 verse 1, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord, that's number 1 shall rest upon him. Number two, the spirit of wisdom. Number three, understanding. Number four, the spirit of counsel. Number five, might. Number six, the spirit of knowledge. And number seven, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And I'll tell you, when you get your heart right and the Holy Ghost is dwelling in you, you fear the Lord. You don't consider God your, your beer buddy. Amen. You don't consider God some whining little thing going, Oh, I wish you would. Oh, I just want you on my team. Will you be on my team? That's not God. When you get the Holy Spirit of God in you, you have a fear and a reverence and a respect for God and His Word. Somebody say amen. That's exactly what goes on in your life. But by the way, I'm going to th as I did here a while back, I'm going to throw something else in on the deal. It's not just the Holy Spirit of God. Psalm 12, verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The number seven always denotes the power of the Spirit of God and the power of the Word of God working together hand in hand inside. Watch this now. Providing light. Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. Is what he said. I am the light of the world. And so here we have the Holy Spirit of God. Watch, and by the way, use my, I, for anybody out here listening, I believe in the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's exactly what I believe. It's called the Godhead in the Bible, and in Christ dwelled the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He was fully God, and yet he cried unto his Father up in heaven. In fact, on the day he was baptized, all three of them showed up in the same place. Now, if anybody here ever thinks that I'm Superman, and you say that because, well, have you ever seen Superman and Mike Hargard in the same room together? I'm not, and if Superman were here, he would stand here and tell you that I'm not Superman. But here they show up at the same place at the same time. When Jesus was baptized, he came out of the water. And by the way, I don't care. I don't care what the United Pentecostals say. They say, oh, we baptize in Jesus' name. My Savior, my God, told me when we make disciples, we baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so here Jesus coming up out of the water. Here's the Son. And the Father in heaven goes, this is my beloved Son. And the Holy Spirit descended down in the form of a dove. 
I believe the Holy Spirit's God, don't you? I read something yesterday that kind of made me mad. It was some guy talking about, well, the anthropomorphisms of the Bible. You know what that word means? These scholars dream up these long, big old long words. Anthropomorphism is this thing you learn in Bible college that says that the Bible says that God has an arm that says he doesn't really have an arm. He's simply using language that would help us little kindergarten children fully understand what he's talking about. God has an arm. This says, well, and they use this verse, well, it says in Psalm 90 that you should abide under his wings and God doesn't have wings. A dove does. Amen? Just believe the Bible, people. Don't let anybody pick your brain apart. Just believe the scriptures. And so anyway, and so, and so I believe that. And so inside now, inside the tabernacle, inside of you, dwells the fullness. If you're in Christ, inside of you dwells the fullness of the Godhead body. And so here it is, the Holy Spirit of God. By the way, the phrase, Holy Spirit, you know how many times that's found in the King James Bible, Jim? Seven times. It is cool. Holy Spirit, seven times in the King James Bible. Seven spirits of God. That's, that's, and you have light that nobody in this world has. Nobody in this world has it. The, the God of this world has blinded them. Oh, we don't for, want to forget the table. I don't want to forget the table. You don't want to forget the table, Jim? I love the table. Everybody say amen to the table. And it's a table. I mean, it's a table. And it sits there on the north side. Up in the, in the constellations there, there's Draco the dragon on the north side. He's the northern constellation. The dragon's up there on the north. Well, the table's up there on the north. And Psalm 23, you know what it says. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. God said, sit down here, Mike. The devil hates you. I'm going to give you a feast right in front of him. Right in the presence of your enemies. Somebody say, and that's you. You, you dirty sinner, you. And God says, sit down, son. I've got a, I've got a feast for you. So the table was, was this table, and on it had 12 loaves of bread. It is good. Because, now the number 12, if you want to know what the number 12 means, go read Genesis 12, and it won't take you very long to figure it out. It's God's promise. God made a promise. And I want, to, I want you to listen to me. Inside of you dwells a promise. Even though you are cursed, even though you are a sinner, inside of you dwells a promise. And by the way, it's not a stale promise. Because every day, at the end of the day, the priest would go in and take those 12 loaves off that table Give them to the priest. They ate that. The next morning, somebody in the priesthood got up 4 o'clock in the morning, like your Meemaw used to, and put bread in the oven. And that priest would deliver 12 hot, fresh loaves of bread on that table every day. And I've seen some of you go to Walmart and pick through to the back because you know that's where the fresh stuff is on the bread aisle. Am I right? Because we like that fresh bread every day, even on the Sabbath. They even did that on the Sabbath every day. You know what that, you know what that signifies to us? Number one, this Bible never gets stale. And number two, that, that symbol of promise is renewed to you every day. It's fresh every day. And, and if you ever get to a place in your spiritual life where you think things between you and God's a little stale, it's not because God didn't change the bread every day. It's because you didn't come to the table every day. Somebody say amen. Listen, you ought to just let go and shout and get happy. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, John chapter 6, verse 41, the Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread. 
which came down from heaven. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Matthew chapter 6 verse 11, you, you know what that is? Lord, teach us to pray. And what did, what did he teach them to pray? Give us this day our daily bread. Lord, renew my hope every day. Because I know what I'm made of. Forty-six thorn trees make up my body. And I need light. And by the way, you walk into the tabernacle, you might smell the bread. You can't find it till the light's on. Amen. And you go, oh, there it is. Okay. Oh, then we're not done. Now watch this. Now, you listen to this. Look back at Hebrews chapter 9. Look back there at verse 3. The Bible says, after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called what? I, I, um, I had heard all my life, Linda Carmichael, the Holy of Holies, the Holy of Holies, the Holy of Holies. I heard that all my life, Ken. You ever heard that before? Not in the Bible. I looked... I looked, at, I looked in every I, I, King, King James Bible. Where is it? It's not there. So I don't call it that. I don't know who came up with that. I don't even know what it means. But this makes sense to me. The holiest of all. Now I want you to, I want you to, I want you to get this and I want you to grasp this. Because we're still talking about Jared Lewis. That's who we're talking about. And Jared, it wasn't me, and it wasn't you, and it wasn't the preacher you grew up with in church when you were a boy. It was God who said that that place is the most holy place of any place in all of creation. That is the most holy place of all. That's what God said. And he said it concerning the tabernacle made out of thorns. Now how can God say that? Because God, it's like what God told Peter in the book of Acts. Peter! What I have cleaned, call not thou unclean. Somebody say amen. When God says... It's clean. It's clean. And if God cleans it, then it's clean. And if God makes it holy, then it is holy. In fact, there is no place in the universe that is more holy than Jared Lewis's heart. No other place in the universe. And God said that. God said that about you, Jared. He called it the holiest of all. That's what he said. Now inside of that, inside of that, where is, where is my notes here? Inside of that was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, as we know, represents, number one, the throne of God. So here is God, the whole God of the universe, who could live in any palace that he wants to. And he made a Jared Lewis palace to live in. That's right. That's right. Inside, inside, listen, Jared, inside that most holy place was a censer. You know what the censer, the incense represented? The prayers? That's his prayer room. Whew. Here's the Ark of the Covenant, God's throne, his, his dwelling place, his palace. He could have had any building in the world. The most ornate temple of any religion God could have. Just like that. He could just walk in and say, it's mine. But he shunned all of that. That's why Jesus did not live in a palace. He chose to wait so he could live where his throne is. And it's in Jared Lewis's heart. And so, Jared, is he Lord? Is he king? 
Is God in charge? Is God... You nod your head, peace. I, I can see. There's always a little doubt because we're asked this. Is Jesus truly Lord of your life? And we go, boy, you know, I did some things. But I want to tell you something. Even if you did it, he's still King of kings and Lord of lords. You don't contradict his authority. You don't override God. Satan's been trying it for 6,000 years. He's going to make one big final push here at the end. And you know what's going to happen to him? He's going to get thrown down. It won't work. It won't happen. Christ, I want to tell you something. Do not ever believe this doctrine that says, well, God wanted to do that, but he just couldn't do it. That's a lie out of hell. Yeah. If it happened, guess who did it? God did. And his throne room is Jared Lewis. So there's the Ark of the Covenant. On the Ark of the Covenant, there were two angels that, that spread their wings. They were, they were the, the covering angels. By the way, I, I believe according to scripture, there was an angel that used to have that job and he got fired. He was the anointed cherub that covereth until, God, until pride and iniquity was found in his heart and God cast him down. So now there's two cherubs that sit with their wings covering the Ark of the, the, Ark of the Covenant, the throne of God, ex, ex, extolling and exhibiting the glory of Almighty God sitting in your heart. And then, of course, we know about the blood. The blood of the high priest sprinkled before the mercy seat. How many times? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. And Christ said, it's finished. It's done. It's all forgiven. It's, it's, it's over with. But then we're told in Hebrews, uh, verse 4, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant. You don't like this. The table of showbread and the Ark of the Covenant. You know what they were made out of? Shittim wood. Not just the tabernacle itself, but the very throne of God was made out of shittim wood, thorns. The very table. Christ came down and took on the form of what? Man. Flesh. And by the way, cursed is anyone who says that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh. He came in the flesh. And there that table of showbread made out of thorn tree wood. Corruption. Curse. But it's overlaid with gold. And so, if you were to look at the table and the ark, you wouldn't know. You listen to me now. You wouldn't know that underneath is cursed and corrupted. Because all you would see is the fine gold that, over, that covers over that. Psalm 19, 9, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, much than fine gold. First Peter chapter 1, verse 7, That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, and whom though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Proverbs 22, verse 1, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor, rather than silver and gold. And God has that gold, that precious gold. gold Gold's in heaven, by the way. So, crowns of gold. Streets of gold. Pure gold that's see-through. It's so pure, it's see-through. And God over... You know what He does? He covers. Listen to me. Your sins and transgressions are as thorns in your sides. And what did Christ do with Calvary? He covered your transgressions and He covered your sins. And when God looks at you, He does not see the curse on the inside of you. He sees the, 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 fine, the refined pure gold. That's what He sees. you got a covering on you. 
Now, here it, here it is. I'm, I'm done. Here, you listen to this now. Inside, inside of that ark, in Hebrews chapter 9, it tells us that, well, let's see, where is it here? Get so excited here. The golden sense of the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna. Now, I want you to listen to this. That the Ark of the Covenant now is your heart. Your heart and your soul, they're like one and the same. It's who you really are. It's with the heart, man believes in the righteousness. When the mouth confession is made in salvation. So your heart represents the seed of your soul. It's who you really are. That's where he's living. And so in, here's, watch this. Now there's a pot with manna in it. What is manna? I just repeated myself. I just said, what is, what is it? Because manna in Hebrew said, means, what is this? You know, why, you know why they called it that? Because they didn't know who the real manna was. They, by the way, they still don't. But watch this, now, watch this. Did you know that if the, if the Jews went out on the sixth day and they tried to gather in too much manna, what would happen? It would corrupt. Did you know that the manna that was put in the pot in the Ark of the Covenant never did? It's the Word, the bread from heaven, Jesus. And it never corrupts. This Bible is not corruptible. It's not. And I don't care if they unprint every Bible, every King James Bible in the world and every derivative of that. I don't care if they unprint them. I don't care if they burn them all and get rid of them. I believe there's just enough of us around here that's got his word have I hid in my heart. That if we all got together, we could probably recite and requote the whole thing cover to cover. Because you can burn the Bibles, but you can't corrupt the word of God once it gets into the, the, the sinner's heart. Somebody say amen. It will not corrupt. Whew. I like that. And then what else was there in there? Oh, it said had the golden pot of manna, the, the table, and the tables of the covenant. You know what God said? He said, my laws will I write on their inward parts. And by the way, two tables. Old Testament, New Testament. First coming, second coming, first birth, second birth. I mean, it's all there. And it's in your heart. You see, when you, just, when you get right with God and get saved and, and the Holy Ghost, there's a light inside of you and the candlesticks are burning and the promise is there. When all of that's in place, I'm telling you, you just look at the law differently. You just look at commandments differently. You, just, you don't go around looking at them and say, I wonder if I can get away with that. You just look at them and say, you know what, that's God's law. Let me finish it with this. Let me tell you what you got in you, Jared Lewis. In that thorn tree wooden box of your life. The Bible says there was Aaron's rod that budded. Now I want you to think about that. There's a story about that, and I won't get into it tonight, but Aaron had this old had this old stick that he was walking around with and the Israelites did too, and they all, they all took a, a rod and, and laid them out before the Lord. And the next morning, they all looked, and Aaron's rod had budded. There was a, I mean, it was just, it wasn't, he didn't just pull a tree up. and I mean, there was a, a staff that he walked around with. And you guys have handled claw hammers and axe handles and sledgehammer handles all your life. And you throw them, you know, how, you, know how you get them to, when the head gets loose, what do you do, Sterling? Throw them down in a bucket of water, and that swells the wood, and... You know, that, have you done that, Keith? This swell, this swell that wood up so, you know, and that wood comes in contact with that water. I have yet to see a twig growing off the side of my axe handle. Because once, listen to this now, once we cut it off the tree, it's dead. 
It's dead. And here is an old dead stick that Aaron had. That all of a sudden they all got up the next morning and they looked and on that old dead stick was a bud growing off of it. Let me tell you something. You've got a bud. Remember what I preached Sunday about the scent of water? There's hope of a tree if it be cut down through the scent of water that a bud will grow off of again and roots will take place. Let me tell you what you've got on the inside of you. That bud, let me, let me read the scripture here. Isaiah 11 and 1, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Jesse's dead. Jesse was that rod. It's an old dead stick of wood. means nothing. And yet God promised, God promised that out of that old dead rod, a bud, a branch was going to grow off of that thing. Job 14, 8, 9, this is what I preach then, that though the root thereof wax old in the earth and the stock thereof die in the ground, yet through the sin of water it will bud and bring forth bowls like a plant. Isaiah 27, 6, he shall cause them that come to Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. This is why I don't want our country to turn against Israel and the Israelites. Because God's still got, there's a, listen, you say they're a dead stick. Yes, they are. But I know where there's a bud growing off an old dead stick. And I know what that represents. Ezekiel 29, 21, In that day will I cause the horn of the house of Israel to bud forth. I will give thee the opening of the mouth in the midst of them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Isaiah 55, 10, For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven. We know what that is. That's doctrine. Doctrine, snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth, and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. Now I'm going to tell you something. You, you've got a curse on your life. You're a sinner. There's nothing. Hey, I have yet to see an acacia tree turn into anything else. They, once they're that way, they're that way. And here God designed his whole tabernacle, even his very throne, out of cursed thorn wood. And he said, I'll sit on that throne, and I will feed you from this table, and I will light you with this candle, and I will put my laws and my words, and it's incorruptible, and they will not change into your heart. And then what I will do to show you that I dwell in the midst of my people. I will put Aaron's rod and there's a bud growing on that rod. And as long as you know that that thing's growing in you, you know there's hope that the tree will live once again. Somebody say amen. That's who you are. The God of this universe picked you. Sorry, I said I wasn't going to call you that. But you know who you are. You're the one he picked to live inside of. And I want to tell you something. God's not sorry that he did. God, hey, I know God shoveled Israel off to the side. But he has not forgotten. He's not forgot the rod that budded. He's not forgotten what they were made out of. He's not forgotten his promises to them. And he won't forget. And he won't forget the ones he made with you either. And the king of the entire universe, whom the devil himself was going to have to bow down to one of these days, chose to live inside of you. And he shows us that with that Bible. It's not just some fairy tale story that we tell kids in Sunday school. This is the reality of our lives. And I'll be honest with you, on some days, this is all we have to go on is that little bud. Because we look at the thorn trees and the curse that we are, and all we have to go, we just every now and then just get out and just, just kind of look in there and see that little bud. And it's still there. And God just buried a little seed of hope inside of you that will carry you through until he's ready to make that bow fruitful. You say amen to that. Amen. Heavenly Father, I love you and I thank you, dear God, for this Bible. And I thank you, Lord, for the word. I thank you, dear God, for the things that you show us. God, this book, 
I, Lord, I'll never in my lifetime get done scraping the English off, dear God, much less the Hebrew and the Greek. Lord, I'm just, I'm just astounded every time I read and open up the pages of this Bible. And I, Lord, as I said before, we know right now, Lord, we know so much more than Moses ever did. And yet, everything that you told Moses to do, he did. God, help us to be faithful. Help us to be true. And help us to, dear, to know, dear God, that there's a little bud growing inside of us. Lord, help us to see that hope. Though we know, God, we know we're nothing but an old thorn tree. You help us to see that hope. Thank you, God, for this word tonight. Bless our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Hello, folks. Pastor Mike here. And sometimes you'll hear me talk about during a sermon or a teaching about being saved or salvation. And some people just don't know what that is. And I just want to share with you from the Bible what it means to be saved. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm not here as a pastor or here as part of this church because I'm better than anybody. I'm here because I'm a sinner. I have done things that have violated the laws of God and uh, I need to be sorry for those. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. We all have what's coming to us as a result of our sinfulness and as a result of us breaking God's law. And some people say, well, you know, it says death. Yeah, we're all going to die. But that doesn't necessarily mean hell. The Bible also says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. See, the Bible teaches, and we teach here in a literal place called hell. We believe in a literal place of uh, joy and peace and eternal life that is in heaven that God gives to those that are saved, but we also believe in e eternal hell, a place of everlasting torment to those who reject God's gift of salvation. So we know that we have sinned. We know that the wages of that sin is death. But the Bible says in the same verse, Romans 6, 23, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, including me and including you, would believe in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Being saved means being born again and being saved from the wrath of God's judgment upon us, what we deserve, what we have coming as a result of our sinfulness. So the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I don't know about you, but one of the greatest things, in fact, the greatest thing that has ever happened to Mike Hoggard is the fact that I confessed my sins to God and God forgave and still does forgive every one of my sins. Romans 10 says it this way. It says, If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What it means to be saved is that God has has cornered you with the result and the things, the effects of your sin in your life. The Holy Spirit is bearing down on your soul right now and you feel the guilt of Almighty God upon you and God is trying to make you so that, you, just like our parents used to do, God used to, is trying to make you sorry for your sins. We confess those sins to God, we repent of them, which means that we don't want sin to be a part of our life any longer. And we simply ask God, God, you take over the reins in my life and you be the Lord of my life and you give me the promise of your Holy Spirit in me so that I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven now. And I want you to understand that God offers salvation to you today if you will accept his free gift. Trust in the Lord, repent of your sins. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you watch any of our videos or at some point and God is just dealing with you, you bow your head and you call upon the name of the Lord and ask God to forgive you and ask God to save you. And God promised in his word, and God has never broken his word, God promised in his word that he would forgive you and that he would save you and heaven would be your eternal home. 
I hope and pray that one of these days I see you in heaven and you get to see me in heaven. God bless you. Bye-bye.